Hello everyone, welcome to Oak Ridge First Cumberland Presbyterian Church's virtual Sunday School option. I'm Patricia Pace and we have been studying spiritual disciplines and how important spiritual disciplines are to our growth and maturity in Christ and becoming more like Jesus. So we've talked about prayer, we've talked about fasting and confession, we've talked about reading scriptures. Today we're going to talk about ministering and uh, working with other believers in Christ is a spiritual discipline. So when you were a kid, did you ever play with Legos? I didn't play with Legos very much. I played Barbies quite, quite a bit. Uh, but my next door neighbor, Michael, he loved Legos and he was also very into Star Wars. So he would have these in, uh, intricate, complicated Lego creations like the Millennial Falcon and the Death Star and other Star Wars uh, pieces that he had created and built from Legos. So Legos can make all kinds of things and limitless. You just pretty much have how many blocks you have and then your creativity. But if you think about it, what if you just have a Lego, but nothing to connect it to? Does that Lego reach its fullest potential in isolation? No. And so uh, talking about God as Christians, creativity is the, of the builder is not the problem. God is the builder. There's no limit to his creativity. Hebrews 3, 4 says, now every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. So he is a great builder and his creativity is limitless. And we've discussed in other lessons about how God designed us for a purpose. And that was even before we were in the womb. And so our purpose includes connecting to others to, to finish a greater purpose that God has. So he's called us and equipped us, but he doesn't want us to work in isolation from the church. So I always have um, a little thing, a share a video a PowerPoint to share. Okay, so this is where we get our information and our lesson from uh, Bible Studies for Life by Lifeway. And like I said, we're on spiritual disciplines, becoming more like Jesus. And this is for Sunday School Lesson 2, 21, 21. So before we begin, let's have a little prayer. Dear Lord, please help us to understand the spiritual discipline of church and fellowship with other believers. Thank you for our church and how it's affected each of us and allowed us to grow. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 24 are, are the scripture verses we'll be looking at. And the point, spiritual growth calls for regular interaction and ministry to other believers. So our icebreaker question, when has being a group or part of a group really helped you succeed? So we probably all have different groups that we're a part of, social groups, work groups, church groups. Um, <laughs> I think about work group. We have a new director of schools. He came on in March of 2020, great, great, or actually April. So great time for him. Um, but his philosophy, his work philosophy includes a lot of teamwork. And so under his direction as supervisors, we have really worked together on almost everything. If there's a project that's really more in one field, we all come together and we help that person. And so what I have, what that has benefited, well, one, it, it, you kind of divide and conquer your work, but we all are so unique in our perspectives and our ideas and and so when you work with someone who is a little different than you and thinks different, you can learn to appreciate that. And that brings in something more to your project. So um, a work group, it, I, I have found that has been helpful. Um, social groups, I have a couple of little sets of girlfriends uh, and those really help emotionally and uh, support you and you, you feel loved and and you feel like you can talk to people when you need help about things. And so that part of being in a group has been helpful. And of course, Sunday school groups and church groups, uh, think about Sunday school classes when we actually can meet in person and interact live, uh, how it's so nice and reassuring that there's other people who have 
uh, the same faith as you, but also the same struggles as you and their insight into scripture and their, their knowledge and their experience can really help uh, when you're going through things and when you're trying to learn to be more like Jesus. So before we get into Corinthians, these verses to read, let's talk a little bit about the setting. So we know that Paul has gone on several missionary journeys um, and Corinth has been a part of that. So on a second missionary journey, he spent about a year and a half ministering to Corinth. And on his third missionary journey, he received that there was word that there was a lot of disunity within the church. And mostly that division was about factions in the church, controversy over spiritual gifts and some other things. But those are two we're going to kind of talk about how Paul addresses that. So his letter to 1 Corinthians addresses those divisions. So to this divided church under the direction of the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul writes about unity and diversity in the body of Christ. So he challenges the church to interact with and to minister to other believers within the body of believers. And that's the spiritual discipline we're going to be talking about. So read this section to yourself. So God has designed the church as a united body. And here, Paul uses the illustration of a human body having many parts, hands, feet, eyes, legs, other parts. There's different bones in the body. Just think about that. All the different systems that you probably learned about as a kid, the circulatory system, the respiratory, the digestive system, the nervous system, all of those create one complex human body has all these parts, but all these parts work in sync together. And when we, and you know this, if you've ever had experienced illness, if one part kind of breaks down, it can affect the entire body sometimes. So Paul relates the unification, but diversity of the church, just like the human body. Um, and remember that unity is not uniformity. So even though God desires us to be unified, he doesn't expect us to be the same. So a hand isn't meant to serve as a hand. And I have the example of Mr. Potato Head here. Um, remember Mr. Potato Head, uh, the hand doesn't go where the, where the eyes go. The hand can't serve, it's not made to serve as an eye. The tongue isn't made to serve as the brain, as the head. Um, so each individual part has its function in the body and not all parts have the same function, but it's important for them to find their purpose and, and find their function so you can have one body that works in harmony. So he also, I want to go back here and points out, uh, he talks about Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And here he's kind of talking about social diversity, slave or free, um, and then also racial, Jews or Gentile diversity. So it doesn't matter your racial status or your social status. We are all one under the Holy Spirit. And that's some words to think about now because uh, our world has definitely gone through some division, especially racial division. So thinking about the question, what are the benefits of unity in the church? Well, I think there would be benefits. This comes from Avalon Church in Georgia's website, Why Unity is Important. And that's supposed to say 2015, not 2105. So unity is necessary for the most effective presentation of the gospel. John 17, 23 says, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So their unity love is tied to the presentation of the gospel. The world will know. Um, so the devil knows the best way for the church not to fulfill its mission is to get people to argue over all these non-essential things. So if he can get uh, Christians to be distracted on things that don't even matter at the end, he knows that the, the presentation of the gospel will, will be minimized. And so we don't want that kind of disharmony to cause us to become inward focused 
and lose the, the evangelistic power that's possible. So unity is necessary for the power of God. Okay. So power is necessary for the unity of the mind or a group of people or a purpose that's needed to follow the word of the Lord. So in order to elevate the mission of bringing God glory through obedience to the highest level of order, you have to have unity. Okay. So you can't, can't focus on the minor things, but on the major things. And I think Larry has said in sermons, make the main thing, the main thing. Um, so often we divide ourselves on things that don't matter. And we, and we don't, we don't want to mistake diversity for disunity. Okay. We can be diverse, but in total harmony over who we are in Christ. Um, so if God creates over 400,000 species of beetles, why would he not want churches with unique personalities and ability to reach people? So, you know, you think about, uh, you have more modern churches that have modern music, contemporary music, wear jeans and t-shirts and uh, flip-flops, which all that's okay. And some are a little more structured and have the way they have their um, setup of worship. And then some, some are a little more expressive in things. So all of that is fine because it reaches different people. So unity keeps the church body growing, maturing, and working to its fullest potential. So we know that. I mean, it, um, and unity flows from love, and love unites the church and its mission. So Colossians 3.14 says, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And then lastly, unity keeps Christ at the center instead of us. So I love the way the Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren starts out it, the book. Uh, it's not about you. Okay. So our plans our desires, our preferences, our agendas, our feelings should not be at the forefront. Christ and his agenda should, and the gospel should be at the center instead of us. So when we make that the center, we can become more unified. So lasting truce. The body of Christ is incredibly diverse. All the diversity in the body of Christ can be unified through the Holy Spirit. Every person who trusts Christ receives the Holy Spirit at the time of conversion. So he's given us all of these roles and responsibilities. Um, and Paul recognizes the diverse nature of Christ in terms of spiritual gifts. So we're going to talk about that. To read these. So this addresses some of the division they had about spiritual gifts and importance. And just like the bodies, not made up of one part, but many. So the body of believers is made up. We all have a variety of spiritual gifts. And we talked about that way back in November, I think. And if you didn't do the spiritual gifts assessment, here's the link to that. Or if you want to redo it, uh, I, I laughed kind of because uh, this is my uh, way it went for me. And I Teaching was not my top one, but that's okay because there's lots of people who, who have that gift. And so we all have different gifts and one gift is not more important than the other. And Paul kind of addresses this abuse of spiritual gifts that was causing uh, problems and disunity about envy. Some thought some gifts were greater than the others and maybe there was some superiority feeling or not. Um, but again, he uses the body back in those verses to help illustrate um, and to help the Corinthians grasp his point that there's two, and he brings out the hand and the foot. And we'll go back to those scripture verses there that uh, are the ear and the foot to represent those who might felt lesser or even excluded. So, 
And that's another thing too. If you even, we all have gifts. So you have the opposite end where some people might feel haughty or superior because of their gift might be more visible, but then also you don't need to minimize the gifts that you have received. Um, you don't need to feel less because every gift is important. So no matter what spiritual gift or gifts a person could have, each individual all of us play an important role in the function of the church body. And it takes all of us, it takes all the members of the church to use their gifts in order to be the most effective and harmonious. And if we look at verse 17 here, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Um, so he's, God has gifted and equipped every believer to accomplish roles to fulfill his purpose. Now, so you don't want to question the wisdom of God and the purposes of God by questioning or minimizing your gifts or comparing yourself. So going, talking about comparison, what are the dangers of comparing ourselves and our gifts or gifting to others in the church? Well, um, it could create envy. It could create or have pride if you thought that your gift was um, higher than another. And you don't definitely don't want that because none of us deserve any kind of gift. And so God does not give us gifts because of what we deserve or what we get or what, how great we are because we're not. All of us are undeserving. And then, you know, arrogance is exposed when we look at the sin of others and it's just like that, you know, our gifts are better or we are comparing our sins versus someone else's sins. All of that, when you compare it to God, is just, it, we're despicable. Um, another thing about comparing is it creates a atmosphere of ingratitude. So if we look at our lives compared to other fellow believers, like poor pitiful me, um, we're, un we're showing how ungrateful we are for the gifts and the things that God has given us and that we have received from him. And then comparison creates like a simple competition in some ways for people. So that changes your motivations to do things. And we want to do things with a pure heart. Um, and we don't want to do things for recognition or, or that we would uh, praise that we would receive. I love this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Um, so we want to take our eyes off of ourselves and turn them towards Jesus. Um, this is a line from that hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Um, and then this is a quote, we aren't called to be like other Christians. We are called to be like Christ. So our focus should not be on ourselves. Our focus should not be on other people and the differences in that way, but our focus should be on how can we be more like Christ? And easier said than done for some people. You know, some people don't struggle with things like that. Some people do, but we all have a little bit in us, I think enough that we, we need to recognize this and continually to continue to do things to put the focus in the center on Christ. And that's what these spiritual disciplines do. So lasting truths, um, no one member of the body of Christ makes up the entire body. Each member works best, not in competition or comparison to the other parts. We are not going to question uh, God's wisdom and purpose of what he's given us. God has arranged the parts of the body in such a way that it can fulfill its intended function. Okay, last section, 1 Corinthians 12, 19 through 24. Let me read that. Okay, so diversity is necessary in the human body, okay? We can't all be the respiratory system. Uh, we wouldn't be much of a person if we just had lungs. Um, so a person is able to perform the different things necessary for life. The diversity in the uh, body of Christ is necessary for believers to execute and accomplish the task God's given them. We are all unique. And so, I mean, that's kind of obvious, but... 
it was a lesson that the believers at this church and believers today need to learn. Every believer should be appreciated for the unique individual that they are. And we're all uniquely gifted by God to fulfill his role within the body of Christ. And so we don't want to compare ourselves. We don't want to minimize ourselves. We don't want to be thinking we are superior um, because all of us in the body of Christ should be cherished and special care. He brings out special care to those who don't naturally receive affirmation from other parts. So there are, there are gifts that are a little more on the forefront. You know, you're preaching, you're teaching, you're choir directing. All of those are things that people see. But what about the gifts that are more discreet that people don't see? Um, the more modest gifts um, of service that people have. So we need to also be aware and make sure that we bring affirmation to those people that have those gifts as well. Um, So what does a healthy church body look like? Well, it's going to be different. There's going to be encouragement. There's not going to be uh, discord. There will be harmony. Um, and it furthers the kingdom of God. So what do you think? What does a healthy church body look like? Accepting, that would be one word. So lasting truce. For a church to function well, it must be a body made of members with different gifts. We can't all have the gift of choir. If, then we wouldn't have a preacher. We wouldn't have Sunday school classes. We wouldn't have encouragers. We wouldn't have people who would clean the bathrooms. We wouldn't have uh, people to run the sound system. Um, it's important not to overlook any parts of the body when giving honor and affirmation. All should be cherished. All are important, and we should show special care to those parts of the body that are often overlooked. I'm not ready at the end here. Okay, so what is your role in the body of Christ? Have you determined your purpose in the body of Christ? Do you know what the Lord has created you for? If not, definitely do one of those spiritual gift things and think about how do you fulfill your role and you use your unique talents and gifts that have been given to you by God to further his kingdom. Also, how do you encourage and affirm gifts and people with gifts that are not necessarily recognized? Um, are there any gifts in our church that are overlooked that need affirmation? And then also, do you minimize your gifts? Do you feel superior about your gifts? Uh, how do you align your focus so it's Christ-centered? So that's our lesson today. Um, let's end in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the church and our ability that we can come together and fellowship and worship and grow and become more mature and aligned to your will and we ask that you help us to recognize what our purpose and role is in the church and also to cherish and encourage the other unique gifts that you've given other believers. In your name we pray. Amen. So next Sunday is our last Sunday on spiritual gifts. And so uh, then we'll move on to a new series. I hope everybody has a wonderful week. We had a I worked several days, two, I think I only worked two out of five. We were off Monday and then we had two central office snow days and then two work days, but there was no school for the kiddos and teachers all week. We had some interesting weather for sure, but, um, and our heat went out one day. Uh, so lots of fun and sun bright, but I'm looking forward to sunny weather in the fifties next week. Y'all have a blessed week.